So, hot topics, this is a five, these are five papers that have been uh, regarded two topics. The first one is trends in arts, and uh, three, three papers, and two other papers, hot topics, that are not. So the trends in arts is the assisted reproductive technology in Europe, so in fact is the AIM consortium, European IVF Monitoring Consortium, that every year reports uh, uh, the number of cycles and the results of the IVF cycles done in, uh, in Europe. And it's about 16 years that uh, uh, this consortium from ESHRE, from the European Society of uh, Human Reproduction, is uh, working. And uh, uh, this report here uh, reports on the results of 2012. The second is uh, the ICMART, the International Committee for monitoring of assisted reproductive technique. And if the AIM is a European consortium, the ICMART is uh, a world um, uh, panel of experts that try to collect uh, as much as possible uh, IVF treatments, the data from IVF treatment, treatments all over the world. And, uh, and uh, the, the paper here reports on the IVF performed in the world in 2011. And then there's uh, an interesting paper, Cumulative Live Birth Rates Following In Vitro Fertilization in the UK, and an analysis from uh, more than 1,000 IVF cycles. And why this is interesting? Because today, I think that uh, we have to consider the measure of success in IVF. So if I make a question, what is the measure of success in IVF? What do you consider the measure of success in IVF? The live birth? The, the live birth, baby, yes, but per transfer, per, uh, per cycle. So today the measure of success has to be considered the live birth per start a cycle or per number of cycles because uh, I mean when you start the uh, the trouble of uh, in vitro fertilization then uh, this travel ends when you finish your attempts and the chance to have a pregnancy you have to be considered uh, at the end of the journey then there are topics. Should a single frozen embryo transfer policy be universally applied? An analysis of more than 600 frozen blastocysts transfer cycle. And this is from UK again. And then uh, from Spain, low responders older than 37 have comparable success rates to normal high responders of same age using a novel embryo banking strategy including PGS at blastocyst stage. So let's see the, the first, uh, the, the uh, ASHRAE reports of the AIM. So the AIM, as I said, is a consortium um, that has been uh, founded 16 years ago. You know how the ASHRAE works. The ASHRAE is a big society. There are task for, I've been a member of the, the executive committee for five years, so I know in detail how it, it works. It, there are good things and bad things, of course, I, I like everything. And uh, there are the uh, interest groups where these interest in andrology, in, uh, in endocrinology, in surgery, IVF, lab. And then uh, there are the task force. The task force are the um, 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 people that gather together, that try to solve a task for a limited period of time. And then there are the consortium. The consortium, there are actually two consortium, the AIM and the PGS, PGD consortium, uh, where uh, the, there are some people that work collecting data uh, from PGS, PGD and from the uh, reports of IVF. So this is the AIM, <coughs> and the AIM gets the uh, data from the national registries from all over the world. There are 33 um, um, nations that give their uh, data. Uh, so they, they, the, <coughs> the current, the current uh, 
report is the 16th and regards the cycle uh, uh, initiated in 2012. <coughs> this is our, already I said, uh, 13 country, th 32 countries that were directly entered in each national coordinator into the AIM database through software developed by ESHRE and were analyzed at the ESHRE headquarters. Outcomes include a clinical pregnancy rate, delivery rate, and multiple rate. So the first, the first, uh, the first line here um, indicates to us which is the global need of assisted reproductive technique in, uh, in Euro, at least in Europe. And at least in Europe is estimated that the global need of assisted reproductive techniques is 1.5 uh, 100, so 1,500, 1,500 uh, cycles per million population per year. And you can see that uh, big variabilities that are amongst the uh, national Europe, there are the northern countries, the Scandinavian countries, for instance, that are well above the global need. Uh, look at Denmark, look at Iceland, look at um, uh, Slovenia, Sweden, Belgium, so in Belgium, in fact, there's the, the, there's the effect of migration. In Belgium, at the AZVOB in Brussels, uh, they, they do more than 5,000 cycles, but uh, more or less half of those 5,000 cycles comes from abroad. So uh, since it's a small country, Belgium, this is very much influenced by this, by this phenomenon. And there are some other countries that are much low the global needs, Moldova, for instance, uh, Hungary, uh, Croatia, Austria. And then the, the numbers. So this table here represents the uh, pregnancy rate for IVF in 2012. This table here has three big biases. So the first bias is that it's not mentioned the age. It's not mentioned the age, and there are some countries that the mean age is very high, and some other countries that mean age is very low. And uh, the most important factor that influences the results is the age. The second bias is due to the, uh, is due to the fact that it's not controlled here according to the number of embryos transferred. So there are some countries that transfer three with higher proportion, three or more embryos, and some countries that transfer only one single embryo in the vast majority of cycles. And then there's another bias that uh, in some countries there are no um, um, control authorities that uh, strictly control what kind of data do you give to the central uh, uh, system. So uh, for commercial reason, a center wants to skip the uh, poor prognosis cycles and put only the best uh, uh, prognosis patients. So this is why there's a big difference. Montenegro 50%, IVF, and Czech Republic 17. And uh, if you see Montenegro with IVF 50%, and then you go with ICSI, and Montenegro is some, somewhere here, 30%. So why Montenegro uh, IVF gives 50% and ICSI 30%? I mean, there are, <coughs> there are big biases in these, uh, in these results. But what is... Uh <coughs> What is uh, important to see is that uh, there's a, an increase in pregnancy rate according, taking into consideration all these things that we did, with that we said. There's an increase in the pregnancy uh, in 10 years between 1997 and 2008. And then from 2008, I, I, the uh, pregnancy rate either with IVF or with ICSI are uh, stable. And <coughs> I want to remember the size of this registry. Uh, every year, these mean numbers regards an average of 600,000 IVF or ICSI cycles. So it's a huge number of, uh, <coughs> of uh, uh, cycles. It is increasing the frozen embryo transfer cycle, the pregnancy rate. It is increasing. You see 97, 14%, uh, uh, 2012, 23%. And then it is increasing the um, pregnancies obtained with um, uh, donation. <coughs> Another trend that is uh, observed also in uh, um, worldwide is a reduction on the number of embryos transferred. 
You see, in 1997, uh, one embryo was transferred only in 10% of uh, transfers, and today, one embryo is transferred in 30% of transfers. In 97, more than three embryos were transferred in 15%, so one out of six more than three embryos, in 15% six, of cycle, and in, two, in 2012, in uh, uh, one or zero something. And uh, <coughs> it is stable, the transfer of two embryos, and uh, it is uh, in uh, reduction, the number, the, the number of transfer with three embryos. And according to the reduction of the number of transferred, uh, <coughs> there's a reduction of the multiple birth rates uh, with the increase with the, with the year. And 82% uh, of the singleton uh, pregnancies and 0.8% the triplet or more order number in, uh, in 2012. So in, co <coughs> in conclusion, uh, the AIM covers more than 80% of European data. The number has increased in 5% compared to num 2011. 5% is quite a lot, consider 600,000. Uh, 30,000 cycles in, in Europe. Single, single embryo transfer is increasing. The rate of triplet or more order is decreasing from 3.9% in 1999 to 0.9% in 2012. And pregnancy rate for IVF and ICSI have been very stable in the last 10 years, whereas those from frozen embryo replacement and uh, uh, donors have increased. What about in the world? In the world, it has been estimated that so far 6 million babies have been born with IVF or ICSI. And uh, <coughs> in these days, and uh, this week, uh, people are working on the WHO uh, glossary in uh, Geneva and uh, ICMART uh, W glossary. And uh, they are doing, <coughs> they are updating the glossary from, the, um, from WHO together with ICMART. So <coughs> the data I'm going to present here regards 2011. And uh, the ICMART is, um, uh, is made by the AIM the Latin American Network Assisted Reproduction, REDLARA, Australian New Zealand Registry, and other countries that all together makes 60 countries. The data were retrieved, processed, analyzed, and summarized by ICMAR working with the University of Uppsala, Sweden, using standard statistical test, data from 2,547 clinics, and <coughs> of these clinics, more than 90% uh, comes from 32 countries and 29, 100%. It is estimated that the ICMART covers between 60 and 70% of uh, IVF ICSI cycles performed all over the world. <coughs> so, like in Europe, there's a, a trend uh, to decrease on the number of embryos to replace. And uh, uh, they are going, fortunately, they are being less popular, the transfers with three or more of the three embryos. And you can see the, the difference is high. The blue bars are more than uh, uh, three embryos, more than, uh, no, sorry, one or two embryos, the blue bars. And you see 20%, it was in 1998, and uh, in North America, and in Australia, 60%. And in North America, in 2011, one or two embryos now represent more than 70%. In Australia, almost 100%. In Europe, uh, more than 80%. In Scandinavian country, 100% of cycles have been performed with one, the transfer of one single embryo transfer. And in Belgium, the first six, the first six attempt, uh, if you are lower than 37, up done with transfer of one single embryo. Because they, a few years ago, they made a, they made a um, financial estimation. And that they saw that the, ex the amount of money that they, they have to, to, uh, to spend for intensive neonatal care, for twin and triplet and uh, more order pregnancies, uh, are enough to cover the social security 
for six IVF attempts for the Belgian people transferring one embryo. So they applied this policy. They obliged one single embryo in women less than 37 at the first, uh, uh, for, for the first six cases, for six uh, tr uh, transfers. And of course, reducing the number of embryos also all over the world, there's a reduction of the triplet pregnancies. And you see that uh, the triplets were 8% in Latin America in 1998. 8% is something really unbelievable. 7% uh, in uh, North America. In Europe, in uh, 1998, was 1.5%. With the Italian law, where we were obliged to transfer the embryos, we, we, we reached 3.8% of triplet pregnancies. Now we are 0.2% triplet pregnancy in Italy. Australia and New Zealand uh, in, uh, 2000 and, uh, in 1998 was uh, 2% and now are um, zero something. So in conclusion, over 1.2 million cycles reported, 1.2 million. But you have to consider that only in Europe, 600 cycle, 600,000 cycle. In Japan, uh, 340,000 cycles. So um, this number is uh, underestimated. 67% ICSI, 23% uh, uh, women more than 40 years. In Italy, we are 35% of IVF cycles are performed in women more than 40 years. Transfer of, of, of less than two embryos becoming more common worldwide. And the mean number of transfer embryos is 1.6 now. The risk of triplet uh, plus births is continuing to fall worldwide. And there are large differences in art availability, practice, and results across the world. And this is what I was commenting before, that you cannot apply one strategy all over the world in all centers because each center has different technical skills, different facilities, and different people. So the third paper is commodity live birth rate following vitro fertilization in UK, analysis from uh, 1,000 uh, cycle women. And this is McLernan from uh, uh, Aberdeen University in UK. So we know that uh, uh, live birth rate following IVF has traditionally been reported per cycle or on a hospital or national level. But as I said before in the, in the introduction, uh, the measure of success today has to be considered a cumulative uh, cycle or the cumulative transfer per start cycle. Community live birth rate have not been published in UK so far. This is the first report. Have been recently published in US. And uh, cumulative rates for uh, term singleton live, live birth have never been reported. So the aim of this uh, paper was to determine the community live birth rate following multiple IVF treatment cycles in UK for different patients and diagnostic subgroups sub during two different time periods. So here this is a retrospective population-based core study. Uh, use the uh, the HIF, uh, HFEA link database of all IVF treatments in UK since 1992. The community labor rates of more than 100,000 women who commenced IVF in the UK between 1992 and 2007 when calculated. And then the definition. They defined conservative community labor rates, assuming that no one of those women who discontinued the treatment after three treatments will have likely got pregnant. And the optimal community live birth rate, they assume that women who discontinued the treatment could have had the same chance to have a pregnancy if they continued after number eight transfers. All cycles defined as a fresh treatment attempt or frozen embryo transfer attempt were included up to two years since the first attempt. So is a, is a cumulative within a time of two years. The term more than 37 weeks singleton live birth rates and cumulative multiple pregnancy rates were also calculated. So here we can see the conservative cumulative live birth rate 
after three completed cycles, remember what is the conservative commodity labor rate? Conservative are those patients that after three cycles, even if they will continue, they will not increase their chance to have a pregnancy. The conservative commodity labor rate, it increased from 30% to 42% in these two different period. And this is quite reasonable because uh, IVF is very dependent on technology and uh, two different periods like this, it improves the technology and it improves also the, uh, the clinical outcome. And um, it improves also the optimal commodity live birth rate. The optimal commodity live birth rate are those women that if they continue up to cycle eight, they will increase their cumulative live birth rate. And um, the optimal cumulative live birth rate uh, in the first period was uh, 73%, and in the second period was more than 80%. 80%. Then uh, the cumulative multiple pregnancy rate was reduced in the two periods, and this is because of the a policy of reduction of the number of embryos that uh, during these 10, uh, 15 years have been uh, uh, constantly uh, applying in, uh, uh, in our IVF centers. And uh, there's, uh, there's uh, a reduction either on the uh, conservative cumulative multiple pregnancy rate, uh, sorry, in the conservative multiple pregnancy rate or in the optimal uh, uh, cumulative multiple pregnancy rate. Uh, this is, was in the first period, and this is the reduction observed in the second period. So the conclusion is that commodity labor rates and the number of healthy babies has increased since 1992, while commodity multiple pregnancy rate has decreased due to improvements in reproductive technologies and more conservative embryo transfer policy, which is the clinical implication of uh, uh, trying to define the, uh, the patients that uh, if they continue to do uh, IVF cycles, they will improve their commodity live birth rate. And those patients that uh, uh, um, after three cycles, if they continue, they will not improve. The implication is that the UK cumulative uh, birth rate could be used in the counseling of patients commencing IVF treatment. The results could also be used by policymakers and uh, researchers to determine the provision of an optimum number of IVF cycles per patient based on their characteristics. So if a patient uh, is, uh, uh, has no chance to continue, it's useless to waste um, in, uh, state public money to do IVF. The next stage will be to develop a clinical prediction model that can predict live birth after n number of cycles. So then the last two uh, presentation regards the hot topics. And the hot topics, the first one is, uh, should a single frozen embryo transfer policy be universally applied? An analysis of more than 600 um, frozen blastocyst transfer cycle. This is made by Vlismas from, uh, uh, again, UK. So it is well established concerns have been expressed regarding the complication of multiple pregnancy in art. We have, we have said today, several times. Consequently, uh, everybody, let, let me say everybody, but especially uh, the uh, some uh, governments uh, of some nations uh, are pushing to reduce the number of uh, embryos to transfer to tending to the single embryo transfer. And this is very important to the technology because if you transfer a single embryo transfer, you should be able to try to select the single embryo transfer with the highest chance to implant it to give a live birth. Uh, uh, for this reason, in a fresh cycle, many, let's say, European, European countries uh, transfer one single embryo transfer in women lower than 37, especially on the first or the second attempts. But uh, very few is known about the single embryo transfer in the frozen embryo replacement cycle. So the aim of this study is to compare the implantation, miscarriage, clinical pregnancy, live birth, and multiple pregnancy rates uh, on a single frozen embryo transfer and dual uh, frozen embryo transfer cycle after thorium transferring vitrified blastocyst. This is a retrospective evaluation of all frozen embryo replacement between January 2011 and April 2014 
Only cycles with vitrified blastocysts were included. Uh, more than 500 patients underwent 600 frozen embryo transfer cycle. All blastocysts were good quality blastocysts. Uh, dual embryo transfer and single embryo transfer was almost 400 and more than 200 were compared for patient keratinism and treatment outcome. So you can see that the pregnancy rate if you transfer to blastocyst is significantly, is significantly higher, but already when we reach the definition of clinical pregnancy rate, clinical pregnancy rate when you see the, the, uh, the gestational sac, then the difference is it is not anymore uh, significantly different. And uh, when we look at the miscarriage rate, the miscarriage rate is significantly increased in the uh, dual embryo transfer. And when we look at the live birth rate, the difference between the single embryo transfer and the dual embryo transfer is absolutely not significant. And when we look at the twin pregnancy, of course, if you transfer one uh, blastocyst, then the chance of having a twin uh, uh, monozygous pregnancy is very low, and the twin pregnancy um, when you transfer two blastocysts in this group of patients was almost 30%, which is extremely, which is extremely high. For instance, in that, in that paper that was presented by Sergio before, uh, with frozen embryo transfer, because uh, as I told you, we transfer only frozen blastocysts, with frozen embryo transfer in advanced maternal age, in advanced maternal age uh, um, uh, population, we dropped the, 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 uh, the twin pregnancy to 6% uh, applying uh, different methods to select the, blast, the better blastocyst. So in conclusion, no difference was identified in live birth rates between a single frozen embryo transfer and dual frozen embryo transfer of vitrified blastocyst. However, patients with do dual frozen embryo transfer have hi higher miscarriage and multiple pregnancy rate and lower implantation rates. So the clinical implication is important because the single embryo transfer policy has to be applied in UK for fresh embryo transfer, but the results from this report here should suggest that it has to be applied also from frozen embryo transfer. And this is the last one, and this is uh, uh, something that I, I, I agree, uh, although the, uh, the, uh, the, the methods are a little bit different. Low responders, older than 37 have comparable success rate to normal high responder of the same age using a novel embryo banking strategy, including PGS at blast. Low response in patient over 38 is associated with poor outcomes per cycle and poor outcome for two different reasons. First, because increasing the age at, at 38, at 38, the aneuploidy rate in blastocyst an uploaded rate in blastocyst, and you have to consider that uh, uh, the, uh, from uh, uh, one blastocyst is the results of uh, two embryos on day two, day three. So the analysis of an uploaded rate at the blastocyst stage uh, at 38 is about 40% uploaded rate. So at 38, four blastocysts out of 10 are euploidy, okay? So this is for the first reason. And the second reason, because you have a reduced number of oocytes. And having a reduced number of oocytes have a reduced chance to have a blastocyst. And you have a reduced chance to have a neuploid blastocyst. This is, this is why when uh, older patients, if they are poor responders, then the chance to have a live birth uh, are very poor. Uh, so the banking of the blastocyst for more than one cycle may increase success rate in raw responders and analyzing all the blastocysts with uh, uh, PGS with array uh, CGH. So the aim was to evaluate whether an embryo banking strategy with PGS can be a reasonable option for low responders compared to normal high responders of the same age who need only one IVF PGS cycle. So this is a retrospective comparative study of 48 patients, not so many. Uh, patients were divided into two groups, low responders with uh, a mean uh, number of follicle 0.52, number 19, one that went 
uh, embryo um, AB group uh, and biopsy and uh, and uh, accumulation of the of the blastocyst. Normal high responders mean follicles 9.3, 29, who underwent single IVF PGS IP group. All participants used the same antagonist protocol, 300 international units, so of course the starting dose was identical, um, of FSH and LH and, and agonist triggering. Embryos were cultured, biopsed, and vitrified on day five to day seven. Another important issue that has not mentioned, there was one, one, uh, one uh, paper that was presented showing that uh, uh, the uh, slower blastocyst have a higher have a higher incidence of aneuploidy. Uh, uh, this last year, in 2014, we published a multi-center study with more than 950 blastocysts analyzed, and we, do, we did not compare in the morphological and uh, aspect and uh, the uh, chromosomal status. And, uh, and the rate of reaching the blastocyst stage, so on day five, day six, or day seven, and uh, we could not find any differences in euploidy rate in if the blastocyst re reached the blastocyst at five, at six, and at seven. And uh, the euploid blastocyst at seven day has the same chance to implant that the euploid blastocyst at day five. So um, I do not agree with that, with that paper. So um, embryos were cultured by epsomidified on day five to day seven. And RACGS was used for genetic screening and euploid embryos transfer in a prepared cycle. Dropout rate, transfer cancellation rate, satisfaction and efficiency were compared between groups. And then you can see that uh, embryo banking gives the same pregnancy rate than uh, in poor responder and older than uh, in the control the control group. The number of side rate three was uh, uh, significant, per cycle was significantly lower, but the number of cycle here was, of course, uh, significantly higher because here you have to multiply 7.3 times 2.8. And uh, also the number of biopsy embryo was uh, significantly higher because I have a higher number of oocytes, I will have a higher number of blastocysts, and I will have a higher number of euploid blastocysts to select and to transfer. And this is why the, uh, uh, the final uh, pregnancy rate is comparable. So embryo banking for low responders equalize the likelihood of an euploid embryo transfer and pregnancy compared with normal high responder of the same age undergoing one cycle of the IPGS. But in this way, you can take two or three months to obtain uh, uh, the number of uh, blastocysts. There could be another way, I will show you in the coming slides, uh, reducing the time to obtain uh, blastocysts because the most important problem of these patients is that they have a shortage of time. So dropout rate, transfer cancellation rate satisfaction uh, were similar in both groups. Thus low response is not an impediment to a successful outcome. And I would add that that if you plan since from the beginning a certain number of IVF, the dropout will reduce. So we, why also another reason for poor outcome of these patients? These patients per cycle have a very low chance to have a pregnancy. And in these patients, the dropout is very high because they are demoralized. I mean, they are, uh, they are fed up to repeat. If they have a project, if they have a program, we will do three attempts, and at the end of these three attempts, we will play the highest chance. Then the dropout, it is, it is very much reduced. So the clinical implication is PGS and the third transfer eliminates the risk of missing the endometrial implantation window associated with premature luteinization that may be observed in low responder, but this is, I don't agree so much to this assumption. Accumulated embryos from more than one cycle for just one genetic test proves cost effective, and this is, I can agree. So this is the other way, so this is the other way to, uh, to make um, all-side banking. The dual steam, you start the stimulation uh, on day two. Standard, standard stimulation for poor responder, 300, plus 75 international units of recombinant age from day two, 
he generates an antagonist on day six, day five, day six, and then generates an agonist trigger or side retrieval, stop for four days, do not check anything because it, it will, you, if you check, you will see a mess, you will not understand anything. You, s you, you start your stimulation on day five and you have not to check anything, estradiol, progesterone, or LH, because, or ultrasound, because again, you will not understand anything. You start doing your first ultrasound here or here when uh, uh, the corporal lutea are demised, and so you start seeing the growing follicles. And uh, then uh, at that time is a normal stimulated cycle, and uh, you, you use generage antagonists. In this first theory, in this first series, we use generage antagonists also in the second uh, uh, stimulation, but I, I, uh, I will start not to use generage antagonists in the second stimulation, and the reason is that uh, the, um, the uh, hypothesis is suppressed by the high level of progesterone and by the high level of, uh, uh, of uh, estradiol. Another important thing that you can experience here quite often, and you have not to uh, take care about it, is that mm, some of these patients will menstruate. So if they menstruate, you keep on stimulating, because these are two different compartments, the oocyte and the endometrium, and you don't have to look, to take care about the endometrium because you are going to transfer in the next cycle. So this is what, uh, what you have uh, at the first stimulation. This is what you have at the first stimulation. This is uh, uh, the, uh, the abstract that I sent to the SRM and it has been selected. And uh, we are writing a paper of more than 60, 60 uh, started patients for fertility and sterility. Uh, this is the first stimulation. You can see the, uh, uh, the, the yellow ball are the oocytes. This is the second stimulation. And you can see that there's a huge variability between the first and the second stimulation. And this variability goes even plus 70, 70%, 70 but also minus 30%, minus 60%. So there are two different cohort of follicles. And this raises another question, which is the value of MH and which is the value of uh, antrofollicle count because uh, if the here you have a 0 0.5, uh, now it's, I mean, it's moved, but uh, if you had 0 0.5 and at the first stimulation you have a 4 oocyte, for instance, here you have 4 oocyte, and then here you have uh, 11 oocyte. So what is the meaning of uh, the uh, an antimilinary hormone? And these are the blastocysts obtained, and you can see that uh, you obtain uh, uh, equal number of blastocysts. In, uh, in this first uh, uh, paper presented uh, that I'm going to present at the SRM, uh, we did not check all the euploidy, but in the paper that we are going to submit, uh, uh, we checked also the euploidy uh, rate between the first and the second uh, stimulation. And then you can see that uh, in one month, so here you have to think about per menstrual cycle. In one menstrual cycle, you do not have uh, any more five oocyte retrieved. But in one menstrual cycle, you have uh, almost 11 oocyte retrieved. And the patients with 11 oocyte retrieved is not anymore a, a poor responder patient. And the number of blastocysts is not anymore one, but is uh, more than two. And uh, here it's not mentioned because it was not all the patients analyzed with uh, PGS and uh, the uh, euploidy rate is absolutely comparable between the two, uh, the two groups. How can it work? So for 30 years, we have been taught that controlled ovarian epistimulation had to be start only on day two, three, because we had to push the cohort of follicles that had been recruited in the luteal phase of the previous cycle. And for us, this was uh, something that could not be changed. But if we had studied, and personally I did not study, the literature, in the, it's, more than, uh, it's more than 20 years that is very well known that in cattle and the other big mammals, there are two or even three follicle waves. But it is more than 13 years that is known that two or sometimes three follicle waves 
are present also in women. And why this multiple stimulation within a, a single, uh, a single uh, menstrual cycle have not been proposed so far? I don't know. So in summary, uh, trends in arts and hot topics, trends in arts. Kupka, there are large differences in Adamson, so the AIM and the ICMART. There are large differences in art availability, practice, and results across the world. McLernan, the UK cumulative birth rate could be used in the counseling of commencing IVF treatment, and it can be used for uh, the policy makers and researchers to determine the provision of optimal number of IVF cycles per patient based on their characteristics. Vlismans, hot topics. The single embryo transfer policy has been applied in the UK, but it should be applied also a single embryo transfer policy for frozen embryo transfer. And Ramos, embryo banking of uh, and uh, associated with PGS uh, in uh, poor prognosis patients, in poor um, responders, gives the same results as normal responder after one single cycle. Thank you for your attention.